to introduce this evening Frank Morrill, who is here from Charlton, who is going to talk about the William S. Bullard collection. It's a collection of uh, about 6,000 glass negatives, of which there is a subsection called the People of Colour. And that has been of the greatest interest to us uh, at the Jacob Edwards Library. And we have had, um, I think, three exhibits already of um, photographs. And this is the fourth exhibit this February, um, during the month of February. Um, 80 new uh, items have been, images have been printed by Mr. Morrill and they are now on display at the library. So um, if you'd like to come and see what these uh, photographs look like, um, we, you'd be very welcome. For those of you who are here this evening, you're in for a treat. Um, Frank Morrill is here with um, an amazing uh, number of slides that he will show that are very sharp and very interesting. And the most uh, amazing part about it for me is the research that he has done to connect all the people who are featured in these photographs so that it isn't just blank photographs of people who have no context as to where they are or how they're related to each other. So without further ado, I'd like Frank to start his, uh, his talk and thank you very much everybody for coming and thank you Frank and I apologise for the delay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I'm, you can see what I'm going to show you. And tonight, I'm going to show you some of the photographs that are out there. You'll enjoy the, uh, the ones that I've just discovered. By that, I mean it took a long time to go through 6,000 negatives, years, 20 years. I'm going to show you a notebook later, and you'll see what I've, what I've done with that. But what I'm going to show you now, let's, let's begin. And there's my granddaughter. She got this started. In October 2013, we were working on a book of, on Worcester, then and now, the small series, and she was 10, and I wanted her to do it, so I wanted to get the experience, and I had done some before. So she was sitting at my desk downstairs, and I gave her a bunch of negatives to play with and said, look and see if you're in this street box that I grabbed randomly. There's over 600 boxes, and I just grabbed one. And in that box, she pulled it out, and she turned to me and calls me Pip. What's this a negative of Pip? My whole life changed. Hmm. And I said, I don't know why that's in the streets. And make a long story short, after much research and prodding and her finding it on my desk a few, few months later, we did another book. And I, I remembered it jogged my memory that I bought this collection with a log book. And I said, don't tell me this man wrote down. I remember it was an old, an old account book, pages ripped out of it. Well, he did. He wrote down 980 of the 6,000. Many you wouldn't have to write down because there's the city hall. You know, but, and I started looking and I found number 76. It led to a four month exhibit at the Art Museum and Channel 7, 5, London Daily Mail, Washington Post, interviews everywhere. And I, you know, you get that 15 minutes of fame. I, I stretch it to 16, I'm trying for 17. <laughs> So that, there she is. But she doesn't look quite like that today. She's a sophomore on college. This is who she found, Celia Perkins. I had no idea. And then all of a sudden I look and I look and it says, I think it was Richard Sargent swinging a dog under, under number 76. And I said, oh, my hopes were dashed. Then I looked up top and it said four by five negative. This is a three and a quarter by four and a quarter, different pages. And there she was, and that opened the door. That's the book. It's kind of old. That's what the page looked like. And to show you number 76, I circled it for you right there. Celia Perkins, sitting. Celia Perkins, standing. This is Bates' baby. I, I know that like the back of my hand now. This is him. This is Bill Bullitt. This is a picture taken in North Brookfield. The house is now gone. Everything's gone. It's just trees grown up right there now. Uh, the, the home was still standing about 10 years ago, falling down completely, and I never went to see it. I still kicked myself for that. So I've been there. I've ridden my bike out there more than once to the location. It's very near Brookfield Archers. There, there's the home he lived in in Worcester when he started taking all his pictures before 1908 when he moved to North Brookfield. We'll see some of that. I've gone to that home. I knocked on the door. He lived on the first floor. 
and uh, a person came to the door who didn't speak English while she was Dominican, and then her daughter came behind her, and I had a picture of the inside, I thought, of his house through much research. And I said, mm, it probably isn't because the ceilings were really high. And I said, would you? She said, give, give, give me a picture. She was calling. So she went in the back. She said, sir, you're probably one of going to come in here. It hadn't changed. The double doors were still there. I mean, I get goosebumps talking about it. It was, it was a wonderful experience to see where he did this. And it's right. You'll see where it is in a moment. This is how I put the map on an 1899 map. See, I couldn't find his home because he was on, he lived at, on, on Mayfield Street. And Mayfield Street's almost gone. So it's over in, in the park near Foley Stadium. All the houses are gone. But what I didn't know was Mayfield Street, when he lived there, was across the street. It's now Maple Tree Lane. Mayfield Street was Bradford Street. They, they changed the names of the street. When I discovered that, looking at the maps, it opened it up. All the red dots you see, there's a concentration of blacks in that area, and that's the Park Ave area near May Street. The yellow with the green, that's where he lived. So he lived right in that section. There's another concentration over here near Memorial Hospital, and the 290 came right through that, and naturally poorer people get their homes destroyed easily. That concentration right there is rather huge. This, this is May Street. So this is Park Ave headed towards the center of the city, and now you look up to his Worcester State College. This, this, and this house is still standing. You'll see what this looks like today. I decided to do it then and now for you so you could figure it out. If you go up here, he would have lived right here in two houses. Halfway up there. That's what it looks like today. <laughs> kind of different. Mm -hmm. But the houses are still standing. And this is just up the street a, a little bit. You can see this is West Oldwood. He scratched it in with a pin. In the back of some negatives, that was very helpful. I've walked streets for hours, as my wife can tell you, with the picture in hand. I feel like a little kid when I discover it. And she's always supportive. And I said, I found it. And she says, yeah, fine. Is it time for lunch? So, <laughs> no, just kidding. She's very supportive. That's why she said I made her come. Okay. That's what it looks like today. This is Winfield Street. That's still there. Look in the background. You see the tower? Harrington Richardson on the corner of Chandler. That's all gone. What you do is you take a big beautiful building and you tear it down and let it sit for a number of years and then you put a wall green because you all know that we're short of pharmacies mm. and you can hardly find one that's what it looked like then that's what it looks like today see it's right on the corner it's CVS. i've looked into a number of those homes for research this is just up the street if you head towards the city on mayfield street first street you run into is dewey it goes all the way over the channel that building is still there parker parker manufacturing right there it's still there. Everything else changed. There it is again. This is Park Ave and uh, the Harrington Richardson. That's the Worcester Slipper Company. They had a big ad in the paper. Fur, F-I-R. They couldn't even spell that right. Fur felt slippers. And they made more slippers than any other plant in the United States. Right there on Park Ave. Right now it's the corner of National Glass and Austin Liquor. Oh, yeah. This is not a fair picture because I went up the street a little ways to take it. So you can see up here, I'm kind of in the front of uh, Park. This is Parker Street. Right here. National Glass is not quite in the picture right on the other corner. This was a black church. It says Beth L A M E. That's the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And that's the church that they had. It's, you can see it's almost a cathedral. Three decker, that's gone. That's all gone. And that's their pastor. That's Pastor uh, William Perry. He had actually three children, one after that, and his wife. They lived at 13 Parker Street, just up the street a little bit. Parker, again, is the corner of National Glass. Go towards the city. It's now a factory where that home stood. It's not even pretty, but that's where it was. Reverend, and here's what that looks like today, where the church was. I think it looked better with the wooden church. This is his house in North Brookfield. That's where he moved to. He never married. He was 41. Uh, he committed suicide at 41 years old. He hung himself uh, a little further down towards where Bay Path Golf Course was. Towards the golf course is, is where his brothers found him. He had been hanging almost uh, a month. And uh, it was a bad scene. They didn't go for him right away because he used to travel a lot. So for him to be missing for a while was nothing unusual. 
but uh, he's quite a guy. I think he'd be pleased with what I've done with his with his collection. I don't know. That's it. And mother, grandfather. That's that's his brother Marcus and his wife. That's his cousin. And this is little Robert. I found Robert's. I found Robert's daughters. They're in the eighties. I spoke to one and communicate with the other, they've now passed passed on, but they found them while they still recognized. They knew they had an Uncle Bill. They had no idea what we're talking about. I mean, it just, it just didn't pass down. Nothing came down. And there he is again, right there with the dog. His brother looked quite a bit like a Marcus in certain ways. That's, a, that's an old family picture right there. And he was a, I'm going to tell you he was a prankster. I really appreciate it. I've gotten to know him so well. Sometimes I, I feel I know him. I've spent thousands of hours on this collection. You'll see that he's a big smile. He was a fan of smiling those days. They didn't, they didn't not smile because it took so long for a photo. That's, that's back in daguerreotype days, just before the Civil War. You no. Know, the thing was down, when he was taking pictures, it was a twentieth of a second. You could smile. But it was, it was much more cultural. And they had bad teeth, a lot of people for that reason, so a number of reasons, but it was cultural. It had nothing to do with technology. No matter what anybody tells you, that's okay. There he is with the big smile. And notice right, oops, back up there, buddy. Notice right here, he oh, yeah. his derby hat on the sun for a moment. I mean, that's funny. I'm not ready to fall down laughing, but it's funny for that time period. And that's fun. Now look at his shoes. I think he traveled a lot. Remember when you get your shoes resold? I, I can actually remember that. Uh, and that's Bertie. She's laughing crazy. You wonder who took the picture. Well, there's two possibilities. He set the camera up, which is probably not the possibility. I think that in his other hand, he's got a cable. They they could do cables in those days, long cables. And that, that was a close-up, so it's more likely that's the case. He's a prankster. <laughs> he's prankster enough to take a picture. In that mirror, the left-hand side of the mirror is him taking a picture in the mirror. He's not in the picture. We've had this discussion before. People have said, oh, I think I see his legs. He's not in the picture. I've blown it up. He's not in the picture. But look at He really is in that picture unless he's extremely thin right in through here. But he just wanted to take the picture that way. It helped me figure out the kind of camera. It's, it's almost certainly an, um, an, an E.T. Anthony uh, camera. You, because you, you can look at the picture at the front of the camera. So it allows you to do research. Well, here's how they've been preserved. He kept them for 24 years, and then he died tragically. He, the reason that I've discovered through research, almost certainly why he died, his, his mother, he lived with his mother always. He was a he bachelor, lived with his mother and his brother there, and he lived with other brothers before. And his mother died just bef the week before. He committed suicide. Two, two weeks before he committed suicide. Almost two weeks, like 12 days. And then, for the past several months, he had been in ill health and couldn't practice photography. He did. I have no pictures after the fall of 1917. The best pictures I have uh, of his last pictures were in Green Hill, Souls at Green Hill Park. That's the last ones I can document. His first picture I can document was a steamer going under a bridge in 1894 when he was 18. That's his first picture. I have, I have every negative. So it's able to enable to look at him. And then Charles, his brother, had him for 40 years in the back room. He took excellent care of him. They were in a shed for 40 years. And that's it. I mean, you think, today they tell you they need a certain temperature. I take pretty good care of them. I have all an archival sleeve. But in those days, they're in the boxes. Best place they could be. They're not moving. They're not touching anything else. So he kept it for 40 years. His postman, Frank Gaudet from East Brooksville, knew he had him because he, as a child, had 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 his picture taken by him. I have that negative. Getting on a school bus. I didn't show you that one, but the school bus was a two-story wagon pulled by two horses. That was the school bus. And his picture is in there. So he knew those negative exists and he wanted them. He didn't get them until 1958, 40 years after he died. He finally sold them. Uh, Charlie was getting old. He kept them for 13 years when he passed away. But living with him in his house was his grandson, who he taught photography to. He kept them for 32 years. I met him, I was talking to my wife, coming on, 94 or 95, I met him and started using some. By 2003, he said, you can do more with these and, than I can. And so I bought them in 2003. 
Now, a couple, I'll go through these quickly because we lost a little time in the beginning. Where and how did he learn his remarkable skills? Don't know. I've, I've gone through all the club's names. E.B. Luce was the big guy in Worcester. He had nothing to do with him. But I did discover through a professor in Virginia, University of Virginia, who came up here, Maurice Wallace, came up to speak on this. It was such a significant collection. He came up. He was on the back of the book that we made. And he texted me. He uh, emailed me one day, and he said, are you related to George Morrill? And I said, uh, no, I don't have a George Morrill. He said, you realize that's a two-family house. The other family was George Morrill. He was, a, he was a photographer. He was a little bit older than him. I, I, he moved to Fitchburg and became the guy for 30 years in Fitchburg. Almost none of his negatives exist. He probably took 10 times. He had 12 people working for him. Can't find a George Morrill negative. I don't think it's a relative. I've not been able to find it as a relative, but we don't know. He just learned on his own, and we've had experts say he was remarkable. He was extremely skilled. Self-taught. Why do you take such a strong interest in the black community? Don't know that either. There's 2% of the population in Worcester, between 1 and 2, those 1,900, were black. In the Beaverbrook neighborhood, right around at CBS, it was 10%. If you take all the pictures in the Beaverbrook neighborhood of people, he took 40% blacks. That's, that's so overwhelmingly different that there's a reason for it. Now, his grandfather, who lived around the corner, his father was estranged from the mother and lived up the street. But the grandfather, Charles, he was in the Civil War, and he was in several battles, and he came back to talk about it. Did he, which was a custom, run into blacks in the battle? And some of them brought some of the black back with them. Some found homes for them. Union soldiers, ministers would go down from Worcester. So that, that, that was a magnet that brought them. So did the grandfather sit him down and say, look, you know the kind of situation blacks had down there? Maybe pull the empathy out of them? I don't know. We've got lots of theories, but I don't have the, an answer. Did he frequently sell them? Well, there's a little bit in the book where he says, got 15 cents for this one, 35. 75 cents is the most he got. It was an 8 by 10. 75 cents. Well, that's quite a bit, 120 years ago. What inspired him to travel so many communities? I don't have it all here, but he took pictures in 45 communities. He went as far as Buffalo. He has a crazy picture of him with his foot up on a chair like this. The only thing is the chair looks like it's in the middle of the Niagara River. There's a little tiny peninsula of land about 10 feet wide. It went out, it's gone now. It went out into the Niagara River. And he had someone take the picture. And he's standing there and I blew it up and it's him. Derby hat. In the middle of, there's just water. It looks like he's standing in the middle of the river. So he had... I don't know. He traveled by train. Obviously, he walked a lot of places. I have no evidence. Cars were around by the time he died. I have no evidence he was ever in the car. I have much evidence he rode a bicycle with a strap in the back. I have those stories. And it is a rare uh, collection. It's now almost 250 that I've been able to get 80% identified. Streets, buildings. He, he took his homes and his family. He, I've got everything about him, and luckily. And then his logbook. He took 900 pictures of soldiers, and I've identified quite a few. So I said the Wisdom Research Project, it's an American story. It isn't only here, even though it's a community. It's a story of the black man looking for some kind of fairness and equality in this country. It's, it's quite, quite amazing. And so I'll leave you with that. It's a piece of that story coming up. This is the guy we use a lot. He died about four years after that was taken. Everybody loved him. The photographic experts looked at this picture. I look at it and say, what a cute little kid. That's a great shot. They looked at it and said, his knee has got the right angle to this. And I said, yeah, okay. That's what they did. They said, the art museum saw this picture. That's the picture I showed them and wanted to do an exhibit. That's the one that opened the door. And I started to bring others now, I don't have the skill they had to know what they're speaking about, but evidently it worked. Now, this is Mr. and Mrs. Coles. I, I'm going to, I put the names, I never put the names on them, this is just so you can look at the name while I'm doing it. Uh, they lived at 346. This is about to the right, if Austin Liquor, just about where Austin Liquor is today on Park Avenue. Uh, that was their home there. You can see it's kind of tough, and we had a little photo bomb over here trying to sneak in the picture. That's why I left the whole thing instead of cutting it. And this is the Johnson family. 
Now, they were Narragansett and Nipmuc, Narragansett and Nipmuc, partly, one quarter. This is uh, May, Mabel, and Jenny. This is Jenny, born in North Carolina. He died year, less than a year after that picture was taken. Um, the Johnson family. That, that's a pretty famous picture. These are flaws in the negative, which, which I could easily repair so you wouldn't see them. But I'm giving you what the negative looks like, which is better. Hello. There we go. Oh, I love this. This is Claude Clark. He took the whole Clark family. I showed a picture. I, he had a sister, Zenobia. Cute little girl. She was probably a year or two older than him. This is on 13 Dover Street, right behind Park and Shop, across from Elm Park. Right behind it. The street's still there. The house is still there. But if this is all gone, there's no porch, and the foundation's been changed. The house is still there. Big family there. And his, his grandmother, Mrs. Harden, he took a picture of Mrs. Harden. Luckily, he said who it was, because that was not researchable for me. So when I found Zenobia, Zenobia, it was the grandmother, the mother, Zenobia, his sister. I met Zenobia's granddaughter. She now lives in North Carolina, Gertrude. And I said, Gertrude, how well did you know Zenobia, your grandmother? She said, she died in a bed in my house. She was living with me. You had some good stories. Now, here's the part that gets really good. As I'm speaking with this lady, Gertrude, in comes her daughter with her daughter, with her daughter. We're seven generations back to Mrs. Clark. And I showed, I showed the, the one who was 12, not the very, uh, the youngest kid. There were a lot of kids in the family. I said, this is your great, 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 great grandmother. It was a cool thing to do. It was really cool. That's about as far back as I can. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Richard Wilson on their wedding day. That does not look like a wedding dress, but it is their wedding day. We did the research on it, date-wise and everything. They just got married. Second marriage for him. Second marriage for her. Then we did some research. Fourth marriage for him. So he got around a little bit, Mr. Mr. Wilson. Now, this is Harry and Susie Morris. We were talking about them out there. They're, again... Native American. I met the grandson of each. One of the grandsons was very dark at the exhibit. One of the grandsons was very light. You would not think the person was a person of color. Uh, there was not a white person in between, like the mother or anything. I think I was telling you that out there. Very, very fascinating picture. I have other pictures of this one. I have a picture of, of Susie and an it's all black in the back. His paper stuck on it. So I carefully removed the paper, and he was covering up him. He was standing with it, but he had a, just a really odd look on his face, like his mouth was partly open. He didn't want that in the picture, Mr. Bull. So he just, just took, took it out with black paper and glued it to it. This is Rose Bates. Her, her uh, grandson was the first black sheriff in New England up in Vermont. They just... They just put a big bronze statue of him up this past summer. I didn't go up because I had other things going, but my partner in crime, Dr. Green, who did all the research, went up to it. To the thing. It was a real big deal. And there she is. That's a, that's a cute picture. This is Miss Mary Murphy. She got married right after this to a guy named Murphy. So not much change for her. And again, photo bomb, people sneaking in. She was a domestic. Uh, the house you're looking at, is 26 Parker Street, and this picture was taken. I, I should give you the dates on these. I'm, I'm remiss, but they're all everything you've seen so far is around uh, well 1906 back to about 1899. All of them. This one's 1902, and uh, some of the dates are in there. Some of the dates I can get by where they lived and when the house is still standing. You go look at the house, and you know when it has to be. That it might spend a lot of time on that, but it could. This is an uh, unknown, meaning you see the person in the door that's kind of cool this i don't know who the child is that's a split negative that's what the negative looked like he'd cover one half of the glass take a picture and then oh cover that half and take another picture this took some research this is either howard or william the boy the son so that's why i say andrew's son and they were only a year apart i'd be guessing that's mrs price you're going to see a, a different price coming up soon and this is kind of rough if you look at it. You know, this is not painted. Now, 
Who is it? That was an unknown, and I found her. I found her because of this. 68. And I said, wow, that tells me something. The numbers fell off. And I can see J-T-P-R-I. So I looked up streets in that area. Abbott Street had a J.T. Price living at it, and he lived at 68 Abbott Street. And there she is. That's how you find that stuff. That took more than a day. <laughs> This one is unknown, but I love it because that's a possibility to find that. But I'm too old to go looking in backyards to get that look again, but it's possible. That's not, this is taken in 1903, so it's not Bancroft Tower up in it. That's, so it's not Newton Hill area. So it could be, I'm thinking, I'm almost positive from what I've done, but again, I don't like to say it unless I'm sure. I'm almost positive that right there is Bell Hill. And these houses going up right there on the on that slope is the beginning of Gage Street. So if you if you face East Park with the two lions out there that come from the old train station, and you look up at the hill to your left on Shrewsbury Street, that could be up in that area towards you know coming up the Belmont area. This is unknown, but I put it in. Tough to find that house. All the porches look like that. It's a school in the background. See the brick. So. It's not a fire station because it's, the windows are too small. So it is a school, but let's see. Brick school in Worcester, 43 of them. Your guess. Look at the kids. Aren't they eager to have their picture? Look how happy they are. <laughs> aren't, aren't they happy little guys and girls? Yeah, look at that. It's a great shot. And that, that home looks a, a little more middle class, you know, a little bit. And that one doesn't. And again, an unknown, but just great shots. Uh, Margaret asked me a question, how many have, by the time I'm done with her today, there's still probably 60 or 70 that, that I've never brought out. So, this is Clarence Ward. He did some research in him. He ended up being the ward no one talked about. Now, I met his, let's say, his cousin's son that would be bud ward down in washington dc his cousin's son grew up to be the vice president of um executive vice president of marriott corporation he did very well grew up in worcester was prejudiced against in worcester and in the military had had an attitude when i met him he was about 90 but he was a, a really good guy we went down to meet him went out to dinner with him and so that would be his cousin and you're going to see the cousin coming up but they didn't talk about him. I said, well, well what's with him? He said, well, he, he ran one of those houses on Shrewsbury Street. I said, what kind of house do you know where the women were? You're going to pay him money. I said, he looks like such a nice little kid. Come on. I said, no, that was Clarence. No one wanted to own Clarence, he said. He said, yeah, my, my, uh, my mother used to tell me, don't talk about Clarence. We don't talk about Clarence. And it sounds pretty, you get some funny stories. <laughs> And this is an unknown, but that's, that's a great little shot. Yeah, right here. We got, these are brothers and sisters. This is Hattie, James Harold, and Louis Ward. Cousins of that other boy. Now, James Harold lived to be 32 years old. Born in 1900, this picture taken in 1901. He's buried at Hope Cemetery. I spent hours over there finding that grave. It's one that's in the ground. With it, they told me where it was, and you use the pipe. And finally, I found it was six inches deep. It had been covered all these years. It's now uncovered. You can see it's got a drum on it. He was a drummer in a band. He died. And when he died at 32, the man I met was seven years old and grew up without a dad. So he had never seen the picture. I have four pictures of him, and he'd never seen them. It, it gives me a thrill to bring them their history. It was, it was a nice moment. It was a very nice moment. And uh, Louis grew up to be a, um, an engineer, a fire engineer, fire engineer for a factory. The guy's running the plant, and that's what he did. Uh, Hattie became a domestic. The, that's the last we saw her in. She was living on Prospect Street in Worcester, the last we could find. It's hard. It's hard sometimes. It's much harder on women because they get married, and then you've got to go find a marriage. And that, that's, that's a challenge. Unknown, but it's gorgeous. 
And Bullock was famous for his very well ironed, neat backdrops. Uh, they were always perfect. Uh, and you know, when I said that to the, at the American Antiquarian Society, they brought their photo expert in, and this is one of the pictures we showed them. And I said, yeah, doesn't that? He said, no, that makes it classic. It adds so much more than a studio. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Because this is real. Yeah. And, and, I, and I see that now after much research. But that's great, the doll with old porcelain face. I'd like to have the doll carriage. This is Richard Brown. I have pictures of him. He also has a, a different backdrop. Uh, and he always had a rug one, like they stand on a rug, even outside, on the ground, with one of those big brown flowers that we, um, Sunflower? no, they, the ones all over the bushes, the blue ones, I know. Hydrangeas. He, t he took a number of pictures of families in front of hydrangea bushes, and they'd be standing on a rug in the backyard. He was different. That's a great shot. Mm. Now... If you look closely at some of the pictures, you'll see holes in the shoes. You'll see, because I can blow them up on my screen, and you'd be surprised what you can see. But they were wearing their Sunday best because they were proud to have their picture taken. That was really something important. Some of the people you saw were born slaves. Celia Perkins was born a slave. And a really neat, I'm going to be talking about the Perkins coming up. It's, it's a wonderful story. This is a, a great shot. The calendar on the wall is 1902 when Teddy Roosevelt came to speak, and it's saying that he's coming. They had two more children after that. He was a coachman. He always dressed like that. We have a picture of him coming back from work with a long coat, and he was a coachman. A very good job for a black person at that time. They didn't get into the factories much. Only two people worked at Harrington Richardson, and that was a factory right in their midst, right in the middle of them. Two. Two made it in there, and I'm sure they didn't have the best jobs. Most were either uh, coachmen, truckmen, domestics, laborers, sadly. That's a great shot. If, again, you're not seeing this as clearly as I can. With the negative, and put it up on my screen on my computer, and, you know, you, this lace is clear, sharp, as if you're standing in the room. This is blown up quite a bit. Now, what other jobs could they have? Barbara. Here's a Barbara. 1917. Green Hill. They trained at Green Hill. All their training, and they they wear mass on it. Would say mass, mass on the on the buckle, and it would say that until 1906-7, depending upon the state, when the U.S. took over and said, "Okay, all you militias are now going to be military. You're going to be what we would call the National Guard." And that's when you started seeing U.S. So with the 900 soldiers, when I see a U.S., I can date it pretty quickly. When I see a mass, I know I know when it is. We'll see some of that. That's a truck. And right behind it, you see a school. This Thomas Delton, and that was a good job, railroad. What's unusual about him is a professor at Holy Cross. He's in his 70s right now. His name is Thomas Delton. That's his grandfather. He researches Worcester a lot. Um, that is actually his grandfather. That's a pretty cool shot. So, Maybe mean, 17 years old, I think. And that's Eugene Shepard down there. He had a great job, Eugene. Eugene had uh, Narragansett uh, Native American in him, partly. And, and Eugene was a car cleaner. And that's a good job. This one is very, very recent. Uh, I was looking through some of the last negatives, scanning them. You have to scan them, look at them, scan them, look at them. You, you can only imagine the hours. And this popped up, and I looked closely. You might not notice it there, but these children are black, and so isn't she. It's on the screen. It's it's very evident. And I, and I yelled at my wife, you come see this picture. Now, immediately I said, there's a church. Now, I, I didn't know what that was at first, but as I started to put it together with a friend of mine who now lives in Florida, who I've written a couple of books with, he's, he's big on Worcester Swedish churches, so I sent it to him, and he confirmed where it was on Mulberry Street in Worcester. This is 72 Mulberry Street. This is 74 Mulberry Street. Now, where is that? If you're 290, if you're riding on 290, the long ago used to be a sign that said Three Gyms Insurance. That was on Mulberry Street. Or you see Easton Ave, that big wide street that goes up to Mountain, the uh, City View School. The base of that, is, it runs parallel. I mean, if you're staying at Mulberry Street, you're looking at 290 right there. We went over to look. Church is still there. House is still there. House is still there. But here's a bigger clue. You wouldn't get it. 
but my years of obsession give this to me. Right there is Worcester Normal School. I looked at that and I said, that's Worcester Normal. I know it doesn't mean much to you, but if you look at it, you know, like anything else, if you looked at the pictures long enough, that is Worcester Normal School right up behind it at an angle, which is gone. Of course, City View School sits on that spot right now. I'd like to know the names. I haven't done the research. I will find those names. That won't be hard. Yeah, I've got to get the street directories. I have a lot of directories, but I don't have the street directories. I'll, I'll find who they are. This is a taken on Gage Street. Again, you face East Park, uh, where Shrewsbury Street comes down and you have that big park. As you face it, you see this giant hill of three decades to the left. This is, was taken at the top of that hill. The house is still there. Looks like he didn't label it. Just He, he just labeled it, you love this, girls huh. on Gage Street. Yeah, well, there's a few guys who would take issue with that right there. And guess who? Uh, Mr. Ward back there, he's getting with the girls already, see? Right That's the guy. And so we start to pick them out. And I, I think we recognize we were able to get four, yeah. This girl right here, she was the Johnson family youngest. Yep. That's Jenny Johnson. So we're able to start to pick out a few people, but it's too many. This is a great shot. You'll see that out there. This is also very recent, as the others were. Uh, this is casket at home. That's amazing. And here's how I found out what it was. That's one of the last ones I found. Right there. Out there, there is a picture. He took a picture of just this. This kid was 18 years old, died from acute nephritis. Nef is it how it's And 18 years an athlete. And I said, when doing the research to the other researcher, I said, you see a close-up? That looks like a football uniform. Shit, this looks like a... Turtleneck. I said, mm, that's a football uniform, 1900. And sure enough, he was a football star. And this, you can't quite see it. These are letters. He took the picture from the other side. B-A-C. Bancroft Athletic Club sent a bunch of flowers in the shape. There's a picture of just this. Look out there. Football. Shape of a football. Mm -hmm. So now I have two of that. Plus, look at that. This is Camp Framingham, 1904. Now, why would I put Framingham in a Worcester picture? Because Worcester troops went to Framingham or Green Hill. Tons of them went to Framingham, including Bullard's brother went to Framingham, Brother Henry. Now, your guess is as good as mine. Look at this. The surfaces were not integrated, and even if they were, it's a little bit young. So, yeah, the pictures are stunning. And 900 picks of soldiers, and he's got them fooling around, joking, throwing things, standing in pyramids on top of each other, drinking. So got, he has one picture where the eight guys are standing with dresses. They're all in dresses. And the girls, girlfriends, or wives standing behind them with their uniforms on. <laughs> like, and where did they change up? What's going on on that field? And as my wife would, would tell you, you look inside the tent sometimes. You take pictures inside the tent. What do you see? A bureau? A mirror. It's like they take their furniture and they did. Most of the trainees went for a week. And they took stuff with them. <laughs> One week. It wasn't like the, it was summer camp. It wasn't quite the same. Although they had rifles and I could, some of them you see them firing. I've seen a few on horseback. I've seen some with motorcycle. Many with bicycles. We're going to get to that scene coming up soon. This one I love. Took me forever to find her. Because he had put... M C C A R P. And it, not much space for him. It's McGinty Carpenter, and I found out where she lived in the house. That house is still there. That house right there is on Mason Street, and many houses are gone on Mason Street. It doesn't look like that's got a porch on the front now. That's a single family. There weren't many in that time. And she, uh, she disappears, I would guess, about four years later. She doesn't show up anymore, anywhere. I. I don't know what happened to her. This is Hannah, who went by Anna Perkins. Now, I put age there. You all get a guess. If you get it right, you get a cookie. Uh, you got any cookies? Uh, no. no. Never mind, no cookie. <laughs> Go ahead, take a shot at it. 23. 23. 30. 30? Who said 30? You're wrong. Anybody else? <laughs> 16. <laughs> She's 16. Wow, back here. I said, What'd you guess? I said 16. Bingo! 
We owe you a cookie. She, it's, it's, that threw us looking because, it, yeah, it is her. We're definite. We have other pictures of her. She's, she's had a big family. The Perkins family, the name Perkins, he took, there's, again, 250 pictures of blacks. 32 of them are Perkins. You're going to get some coming up. And I've got a great story for you. Are you thrilled yet? Okay. Great story. This kid drives me crazy. That is a great picture. I have his name. No. My theory is that he was visiting relatives. He was from somewhere else because he does not show up. I can't even find him on the East Coast. And you can look everywhere. Nowhere. I cannot find a Lou Sawyer. And he spelled it that way. You, you wouldn't. And I look on the Lewis because obviously that's easy. You know, you try different names here that are like that because he made some mistakes like that. Not too many. On misspelling, he made some. And when you go to you go to Ancestry, and I go into the actual records. I know they're getting rid of cursive, and when they do, none of those children are going to be able to go into the actual records. They're going to have to believe the person who read it and typed it wrong, and they typed it wrong. A lot and I don't blame them some of the time they didn't do a good job on whites they didn't even try to get the blacks right shame uh, good story here Angeline Perkins and her children Nellie and William this is William Dempsey Perkins he grew up to have a daughter Lois Lois married moved to Boston she got interviewed by my partner at 94, five years ago. I don't think she's still living. She was good then. But here's one of the great things about her. There's only two cases. Lady from New York and Lois Cato Perkins had the picture. She had this original picture that Bullard gave to her grandmother and must have passed it down to William. Only happened twice. I have lots of original pictures from William Bullitt. I have a bunch of sepia-toned, old, old pictures. None of them are black. I'm, I must have 200 houses and some whites and Institute Park and Art Museum, places like that. But none of them are the originals from the blacks. Now, this is a very interesting story. Yes, they are little people. Today we would call, you know, midgets, dwarfs, all the terms that they have used. They are their sisters, unusual. Now, you'll notice I said Louise and Martha. Martha was born in 1906. Louise was born April 1909. Louise lived to be 84. Yeah, no, it's 84. She died just in the middle of eight, before she turned uh, one year older in 1994. I could have known her easily. And so when I went into the black community, with that picture, they went crazy. They all knew her. They lived their lives there. They were, babys they were babysitters for people I talked to. There was another gentleman my age, Nick. You know, remember Nick Skyler? He said, That's my, she was my babysitter. Not, not her. Not her, but her. She died in 79. He said, when I was a little kid, I was afraid of her. He said, they were tough. Thinking, um, the older one went to school one day to pick up the child she was supposed to be babysitting for. They wouldn't, this is the Chandler, the earlier Chandler school, wouldn't release the child until she went home and got her mother. And they said she caused such, such an uproar in that school. I mean, she was so insulted. You can imagine. Of course, they grew up to be, you know, bigger than what you're looking at. Now, the story behind them is Louise and Martha Price. So I did some looking. Well, we knew them as Hara as we did the research. So I went back. They were born in 1906, 1909. The mother doesn't marry Mr. Hara, who became a widow in, in uh, 1912. Till 1914, she marries him two years after he becomes a widow. So I think they were fooling around before that. Personally, I asked them. I would go Just kidding. I don't know. She never married. That was her first marriage, and I have the marriage certificate, and it says first marriage. So she had both of those children who were, were both small long before she met the father. He adopted them, and they took the name Hera. So it really threw people to see that. This one I just found. Now, the last one I found before, but you hadn't seen it. 
on here. This is a new one, Green Hill Military Camp, 1910. Why is this picture a mystery? He's black. He looks like an officer, and his services were not, they were not integrated. There were no black encampments. Why is he there? I don't know. And I know, I know everything about it. I know it's Green Hill. I know it's 1910, what he told me. And he certainly looks like he'd be an officer. The sword, he's got it all. He looked very sharp. I can't get any insignia off him. I blew it all up in here. You know, you're not getting a pencil cross rifles. And usually on the hat, it would say, uh, you know, the company, uh, it would say 2L. So it would be L Company, 2nd Regiment. I can't get anything off of him. Uh, I, I can read these back here, but it's, it's not him. That's, and look at the furniture. You bring your own table, no problem. <laughs> that, that was common. But even bureaus for their clothes, they'd be in the tent. That's a, that's a phenomenal picture. This one we know. He did serve in the military. This is Reuben Griffin. He knew Reuben. He took seven pictures of Reuben, even inside his house, whittling, smoking a, uh, a pipe. He took more pictures outside, relaxing into a tree. Notice what his belt says, Mass, M-A-S-S. -S. He was in the 6th Regiment, Company L. That was the Black Regiment. He was wounded during the Spanish-American War and came back home. He lived out his life. He was a custodian for a while at Boys Trade and died on Oak Bluffs. Anybody know what Oak Bluffs is? Arthur's Vineyard. Yeah. That's where he died. So we know everything about Reuben. He's a fascinating character. Again, I'm talking today, I, I could spend, I really could spend a half an hour on him just telling me what we found. Now, there she is again. I'm going to tell you about the Perkins family of Camden, South Carolina. I saved the, the, the good stuff for last, really. Uh, that's her husband, Edward. He, uh, we did find him in another picture, and we verified it because he got the first knuckle of his finger missing on that hand. And that's Celia. Both born slaves. Celia Perkins was a Boykin, B-O-Y-K-I-N. And um, there was a woman in the South, South Carolina. Her name was Mary Boykin Chestnut. Hence the name. They took names of slave masses. James Chestnut is where they were slaves. The Perkins family was slaves on the James Chestnut uh, Mulberry, um, um, Mulberry Plantation. Still there. Built the house is still there. James Chestnut was a U.S. Senator from South Carolina. When the war started, Civil War, he moved up to be an aide to Jefferson Davis. He was at the highest, um, the wife stayed home and tried to take care of things, and then she wrote... Uh, she wrote the best history you have of a Confederate wife going from everything to nothing. They had 500 slaves on three plantations. We found the Perkins listed on the manifest of their slaves. Jeanette had, she had gone down, has been to the plantation, they won't let you, it's owned privately, and sometimes you talk nice to let you on, but they wouldn't. So we know all about the Perkins. Now, that's the important part. That's this guy's family. Again, she got her name Blake, and she was a slave from the, from the mother thing, uh, the, the mother of the, uh, the slave family. This, this guy was one sibling. He had 23 others. The father was a man named King Perkins. We don't have a picture of him. I have a picture of him, but Bullet didn't take it. King Perkins. I do have a picture of, of Letitia, the wife. She looks tired in the picture. There's a possibility, you know, 24 children will do it, right? King Perkins became famous because he's born in 1802. I mean, really, right in the middle of slave. They didn't have even a hint of, of freedom coming up. He didn't die until 1912. He was 110. Wow. So he, was a, he made the papers down. He was back in Canada when he came up to visit. So we have some Perkins here. Frank, sure. you said Mary Chestnut? Yeah. Mary, Mary Boykin Chestnut, yeah. Is that any connection to Mary Chestnut, who's a major voice in Ken Burns' Civil War? That's exactly her. Nice going. She, she published a book which was the, the, the life of a, of, a, of a Southern woman. Southern he, woman of he all kinds her. of money. He quotes her through that whole series? Yeah, that's her. That, that's... 
And that's where the name Boykin came from. It's nice, thank you. Guy knows his stuff over there. I like that, I like that. Now this is one of them. This is a, a son. Now I, sh I showed you Edward, who was married. This is his brother. This is Thomas. Now you'll notice right there, I found that 90. And I see the T. Perkins, I looked him up. That's Abbott Street. If you are trying to find 90 Abbott Street today, I think it's Antonio's Pizza right there on Chandler Street across from it's the stadium. It's, the yeah, it's, it's right behind Walgreen Drug on Park Ave. That street, one house remains. This is the shame that the city let this happen. If you were standing at Walgreens, looking into it, remove Walgreens and then look everywhere to your right and look for the next thousand feet. Nothing but weeds and junk growing up. That was a bustling neighborhood, and several of the Perkins lived there. Many of these blacks, those red dots that I showed you, most of that was in right there. They took all the houses down in the late 60s, very early 70s, for Copus Engineering. They were in, going to do some work along with Harrington Richardson, and they were going to just build this massive plant. They took it down, some by eminent domain, one house stayed. That guy wouldn't sell the house is still there. And then they say, yeah, never mind, we moved to Mill Creek. And it has stayed vacant for 50 years. That's disgusting to me. The more I get into this, the more angry I get. I walked that neighborhood with NPR. NPR was doing a thing on this years ago, four years ago. And I walked the whole neighborhood, a two-hour walk, and uh, I had to give my opinion on that. It, it showed up. It was part of the clip. It was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Well, Abbott Street, like from Pleasant to Chandler, there's still that one way that's Abbott Street. Yes, that's, that's and what then it's Abbott Street. Right. And it, it crosses Channel, yeah. but there's only one house there. And there was a school there, too. It makes me still think there. when you had that brick building. Yeah, the big there. school, Abbott Street is still there. Yeah, I was it's, wondering uh, if that might have been Abbott Street, that one that you said there was like a school there. Yeah, you know, you look, but if you look, I he took pictures of every school, every firehouse, every four. And, and I can identify them all from the pictures, but when you see a piece, I mean, if you're looking at East Kendall Street, and you're looking at uh, Woodland Street School, you got a fine tooth comb. I mean, they, they look the same. There was a lot of that at that time. Schools built about from those early bird schools about eight, late 1874, and they built them right into 1910, 1911. And they were built to stay. They're beautiful. That's why a lot of them, like Adams Street School, up off of Shoes Street, is now condos. They made good condos. I mean, they were beautiful buildings. That picture that was slain in the background. Where? <laughs> oh, yeah, right yeah. yeah. Amazing. Good eyes. It's, it's, you find so much. Remember the old mailbox? It's all right. Oh. And the, the glass going up. Now, this is Rose. Three more of those children. No, two more. I'm sorry. Because this is... That's the guy. That's Edward. That's Celia's husband. That's his brother Abraham. And that's Rose. Rose... Doesn't die until 1950. She's the last one born. She wasn't born into slavery. She was born in late 1865. She was born there on the plantation, but they were freed, as you know, in, in uh, 19, 1863. But she comes up, um, and then she comes up in a, in a way, she was deposed about her father's land because. Celia Perkins and her husband Edward ended up owning a piece of the plantation. And then, of course, after Reconstruction ended in 1877, and we have the Jim Crow laws and all of that comes in, the prejudice, you're going to get them out of there, uh, they had to sell. They had to sell and they moved in 1879. They moved to Worcester. That's when they came up. But Rose did a deposition down there, and we read it, got the whole thing. And it, they asked it a question. And it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the words she used. It was something along the lines of, uh, like Jeanette's book, which was First Fruits of Freedom. They said, when exactly did your father, who was king, when did he walk this lane with you to try and determine where it was and, and place a string? They would put a string and tie it from tree to tree. That's my piece. And she said it was the, uh, the first something of freedom. And usually things don't escape me like that. But it was an odd phrase. In other words, it was right after 1865. Uh, he got the land, and when I was a little kid, we walked it. So it was probably about 1877, 78 that she walked the land. They ended up getting it. They ended up 
winning that case, and she she moved up and stayed in Worcester, and you're going to see something significant about her. That's her house. That's gone. And that house would be right behind Walgreens. She lost her house. That's been all torn down. But she owned a house. All her brothers and sisters were born slaves. She almost was born a slave, and she owned a house. Not only did she, wait, wait, you'll see. She rode a bike. Ooh. Now, the bike craze hit Worcester with Major Taylor mm -hmm. right around the turn of the century. It's the world's fastest bicycle racer, black. So he had to be faster to be, to be equal. I mean, I read much of his book. I have a copy of his autobiography. Just, he wouldn't be allowed in certain races. They would change the time on him. And he overcame that by being that much better. He was the fastest bicycle. I mean, you're going to see a guy that looked like him in a moment. One of the last negatives I found is my wife's favorite. And Margaret's. <laughs> Coming up. Bicycle craze was huge. And this looks like it's on the wrong side. It should be on the other side, right? It should be, but that's correct. That is what the negative is. When I was doing an exhibit at the Whistler Art Museum, they turned the picture around. Said, oh, you gave us that one wrong. I said, no. That's right. Some bikes were on the left. Now, split negative. This is the same guy, believe it or not. Three years apart uh, from, well, you haven't seen her yet, from a person coming up. This was the older, this is Ike, or Isaac Perkins. Now, notice his handlebars are different. They're racing type, type handlebars. A little horny, beepy. But he's got this. He was a courier. He's dressed as a curry, and he was a curry, speeding all over town with his bicycle as a split negative. Another guy with a bike, unknown, but it was a way to get around. This was a split negative. I only gave you half of it. The other half, the other half was a little boy, a little white boy sitting on those steps, but by himself, you know, separate picture. I looked at that closely with my wife last night, and I said, oh, that sure looks like Major Taylor. I got pictures. Why you didn't take Major Taylor, I do not know. That guy looks very much like him, enough that I was pulling up pictures to try. I'd love to have an unknown picture of Major Taylor. Yes, very much. Some of my pictures of bicycling are, are in the Major Taylor exhibit. Look at that picture. That's my wife's favorite. That's one of the last ones I just found. I mean, that's a statement. You know, I mean, that, that, that just says a lot. He could be today. And I don't know who it is. And that's going to be a tough one. This is not a landmark there. That's going to be a tough one. The only thing, the only hope I have is that some of the some descendants going to say, "I know who that is. I have the picture, or picture like it." Now, this is Edwin here. This is Celia Perkins' husband, and this is all collard greens. And all of those houses are all gone. This was behind Walgreens. That's a community, and it's not a falling down community, but it was easy to take. You don't have a voice, it's gone. Oops. This is Martha Patsy Perkins. He labeled this person Patsy Perkins. So we went looking for Patsy Perkins everywhere. Couldn't find her. One person said to us, this person was uh, uh, Maureen Taylor. She's known as the photo detective. She's been on TV shows, dozens of books out. What she does is look at photographs and tell her, go by the stitching. Oh, that's 1906, man. I mean, she's brilliant. We met with her one afternoon because she's from Providence for two hours, showed her these pictures, and she said it's the finest collection she'd ever seen. And she'd been doing that 30 years at the time. So, she got involved with us in email. She came to talk at Clark for us. And she said, oh, Patsy Perkins, have you looked up Martha Perkins? And I said, and why would I do that? Well, she said, because at that time period, Martha's nickname was Patsy. And I said, that makes no sense. She said, you ever hear Martha Washington? She never went by Martha. Her name was Patsy Washington. She went by Patsy. So we looked up Martha, and the world opened up. What I, I tried to find right here, you see cross, it's a beautiful buckle with crossed uh, rifles on it. 
I've blown it up so that I can see it's this big. It's clear. It's sharp. I can't find another one like it. I've gone through images. You know, I don't know. But you get a lot of the, I wish I knew type things. And there it is. But I, I can, on the computer, I see it very clearly. That's kind of wrong. problem. And we end with this picture. You've been listening for about an hour, and I appreciate the questions, the answers that you were able to give. This is Patsy Perkins. So I said to Maureen Taylor, look at this. We got her on her wedding day. She said, no, that's not a wedding dress. I said, of course. And she said, that dress would be light blue or uh, possibly, possibly light pink. And I said, why do you know this stuff? And she said, you know, thousands of hours of research. She said, that's not a wedding dress. I said, well, what would it be? She said, that would be a coming out dress. At that time, they would have their own way of having a debutante ball to match because if you were part of the Knights of Pythias, you couldn't be in the white Knights of Pythias, so you had yours. If you were an odd fellow, you would be in a black group. If you were going to have a debutante ball, which they did not call in them, they call those reckoning balls, and not the wrecking ball, where you would, this is your, yeah, nice goal. This your day of, your day of reckoning is now here. Look at me. And what better way? It's beautiful. Yeah. And so with that, oh, on your line. There we go. And the research does go on. Thank you. But before, 